baby, good morning, one and all. Sorry, it's a you know what? If you live long enough and you're fortunate, you'll get to meet an American hero from time to time. If you're lucky, you'll get to meet at least one. I've, I've had the honor of, of, of meeting several during my life. Three Medal of Honor recipients tonight will be at the Strand in Marietta. That's on the square in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, three of them from three different wars. Uh, Vietnam, uh, the, the uh, uh, Iraq, Afghani con conflict that we're yeah. in now, and a Iwo Jima survivor uh -huh. from World War II. Uh -huh. And these are three American heroes. Let me introduce you to another one, Colonel Lee Ellis of Vietnam. Colonel, how are you? Good morning, Moby. I am glad, good. glad you're here with us today. I'm glad to be alive and glad to be free. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's been 40 years, right? Uh, right. That, that we're celebrating right now, the 40th Anniversary. year mm -hmm. of the release of... Of POWs. The, yeah, mm -hmm. the, from uh, Hanoi Hilton there. Yeah. How, how many of you were in there at one time the most? Did, and did some of them ever come and go, other than obviously right. being called to glory? Well, there were about 340 of us that were there more than five years. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the war, when the bombing kicked, um, kicked in again, which really got us out of there, mm -hmm. they brought down another 150 or so. Several B-52s went down, and, you know, they have six or seven guys on the crew. Sure. So that, that mounted up in a hurry. But... 500 is about the number that came out from North Vietnam, and then across Southeast Asia, another 150. Yeah, but th these weren't in Hanoi Hilton. No. They all, did they, all, they didn't come to the Hanoi Hilton. No, only all about all 500 came okay. to the Hanoi Hilton. Jeez. And about 340 of us there were there five years and you sp is it fair to say you spent five years in hell? Fair well, to say? Uh, I guess you could say that. It depends on how you look at it. There was some day, we used to say some days you get the bear and some days the bear gets you. <laughs> so some days were worse than others. But uh, the fact that we were away from our families and oh, buddy. locked up and, uh, and your family didn't under know an how impressive you were. industry. Your family didn't know if you were alive or well? Alive well, or dead, generally they didn't. Uh, I wrote my first letter at two years, six-line letter, and I got my first one at two and a half, and then I wrote one about every three months after that. Did your family get those letters? Yeah, they did. Uh, six months delayed. Okay. They were always delayed six months. Did they keep telling you what terrible people you were? Or yeah. What? Oh, yeah. Criminals? And... Yes. Oh, yeah. Criminals. We were called criminals all the whole time. Tell me about being shot down. Well, when the airplane was hit, it blew up into several pieces immediately, which is very unusual, mm -hmm. and had to jump out. Everything worked great. I followed my training. I wasn't scared. My life didn't flash before my eyes. I was busy working, trying to get away. And unfortunately, the because uh, that's your that's your job. When you land, job. your job is to escape, evade right, and escape. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I was even trying to escape in my parachute, trying to slip it over my parachute and guide it over to the river and land in the river. But I didn't have enough altitude, so I hit the ground, did my parachute landing fall. PLF. I, I called my radio. Exactly. PLF. I got on my radio and called the wing uh, wingman. I said, "I'm 300 meters north of the river. Start strafing at 400 meters. I'm headed south to the river." I saw those guys after the war, and they said, you know, we heard your radio call, but we can't shoot that good. <laughs> we're, afraid we, we're afraid we'd hit you. And I said, he said, they were pretty close. And I said, yes, they were too close. They were 20 yards away, as it turned out. I didn't wasn't sure at the time, but they were immediately around me. And it was jungle area? No, it was a floodplain. Uh, the jungles were not far away, but it was a floodplain near the coast. Colonel, yeah. Colonel. Say, I, I'm a wimp. I, uh, no way could I have done this. Yeah. But but the training you went through. I mean, yeah. Did you go to Sears School before yeah, this? Yeah, I though? went to a couple of three schools. I went to Sears School and then uh, Water Survival and Jungle Survival in the Philippines. Sears, uh, uh, go ahead. Survival, Escape, uh, something, and Evasion. <laughs> it takes me, takes me to death. Rescue yeah. and Evasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah something, something like, like that. that. But I, I remember the term Sears School. Yeah. But, you know, and that's – during this period of time, you're, you're like hell prisoner where you're in Sears school right. and, you know, you don't know daylight from dark and all the yeah, yeah. tough time. And then all of a sudden they raise old glory and you say, it's over. <laughs> right. It wasn't like that. With the no, Hanoi Hilton. it wasn't like that. When, uh, when they called you all to the courtyard of the Hanoi Hilton, said, well, you know, there's been peace talks in Paris mm -hmm. and we're releasing the yep. prisoners. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a jubilant celebration. Is that correct? No, it wasn't. We, uh, we didn't want to celebrate for them because everything they did was for propaganda. They were always mm -hmm. trying to take a picture. You know, two, three times a year, we'd have a special meal at a holiday, and they'd, a cameraman would sneak out from behind just as we picked up the food and take a picture. They'd tell the world we ate like that every day, which mm -hmm. was a lie. So we were very sensitive about them taking a picture of us celebrating and, you know, and all that. So when we heard the news, we just kind of turned around and went back to our, toward ourselves. You told everybody else? Uh, well, we all knew. I mean, they oh, told the, everybody the, in the everybody camp. Everybody was there at once. Everybody so, at okay. one time, yeah. 
So we, we weren't going to get our hopes up. We Emotionally, we're pretty flat anyway because we want to get too high and be disappointed. We mm-hmm. don't want to get low and get depressed. Mm-hmm. So we stayed pretty flat, and we just kind of went on about our business because we knew it's never over till it's over. Was there ever a day you said, I'm never going to see my family again? No. I always believed I'd get out of there. Colonel. Colonel Lee Ellis is our guest. Man. Uh Gosh, you know, you hear so much about this and to actually talk to somebody that lived through that and not only lived through it, but prospered in the wake of it. You can't hit, listen to this guys, folks, listen, radio family, Colonel Ellis came out of that hell hole. And how long later were you were flying again? Well, I took a couple of months of vacation and then I oh, went back really? to work. Oh, really? What a wimp, gosh. Oh, yeah. I went back to work and I went back to flying, man. I was My flying career had just gotten started. So I went, I climbed back, back in the Back cockpit. in fighter jets. You went back in there. You went, you went back yep. to the war effort. Well, I went back into flying uh, high-performance jets right away. Oh, buddy. See, because you would think from the wimpy perspective of a civilian over here that's never served and never been through that and never been you. called on to have, yes, me, to, ha- to, have, to have the level of character and commitment and resolve that, that that took for you to do that. I can't imagine going through that, being released from that prison and doing anything except just going home, watching Oprah and hugging my wife, you know. But, dude, you got right back to work. Well, I'm sorry about calling you for, dude, but you know, yeah, it's okay. Dude. For that sort of thing, we're pretty left-brained. You know, it's like we just look at it kind of like facts, and this is what I want to do, so I go do it. You know, it wasn't any, I didn't have any emotional hang-ups at all about flying. Isn't it amazing that 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 the Americans, true Americans, I have are... emotional hang-ups about propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what are you talking about? Well, you know, uh, when you've listened, we had a speaker in every cell we ever lived in. Uh-huh. And three times a day, we got propaganda. Right. A lot of it was from American sources. Uh, so Tom Hayden, for instance, first day we were there was the one first one we heard. You know, that was Jane Fonda's yeah. first husband. So anyway, <laughs> we uh, we got used to hearing propaganda and recognizing, you know, what's true and what's not true. And I guess I'm very dis- a little bit discouraged about some of the stuff we hear in our own country now because it's uh, it's all to make you feel a certain way. Mm-hmm. Rather than deal with the facts and deliver facts to you, exactly. So uh, they always entered entered every almost every sentence in some of their propaganda with U.S. bombing of old folks, women, and children. Oh, so God. when everybody I hear somebody talking about old folks, women, and children being deprived, I get a little concerned that uh, they're trying to get into my heart and therefore into my head. We don't let that happen. No, gosh, man, you're a great guy, Colonel. Uh, Many times uh, in in the last several years, you know the Dixie Chicks. Nobody's playing them anymore. Country radio mm-hmm. doesn't even acknowledge the existence of the Dixie Chicks. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people, more of a liberal leaning than, than I tend to be, uh, say, "Yeah, I can't believe y'all don't play the Dixie Chicks." And I said these words, and I want your opinion. I want your response. First thing you think of when I say this to you, I'll forgive the Dixie Chicks when Vietnam veterans forgive Jane Fonda. Well, I think the first thing of forgiveness is always true repentance. <laughs> secondly though it is possible to make a decision sometimes to forgive somebody uh, when they haven't repented that's much more difficult yes sir Man. it's probably the way to go because once you in forgiving uh you kind of free yourself and i guess in a way i haven't i don't i didn't, didn't have to forgive jane fonda one way or the other i don't have to forgive her i mean she did what she did and so that, there's consequences for that you know my life is so good why would I want to spend one second of it worrying about somebody? Hey, Jane Fonda. Yeah, bitterness or anything like that. So I don't have any bitterness. Did you know she was there when that happened? Oh, yeah. They uh, they let everybody yeah. know. A lot of the stuff on the Internet about Jane Fonda is not true. Mm-hmm. It's a lie. I can assume that. Okay. Uh, but the reality was she did some pretty serious things against us, making a tape to the pilots telling us that we should uh, cooperate. Mm-hmm. And change our viewpoint about things. Uh, so that and was she was uh, over there collaborating with the yeah. enemy to do that. Uh, you've got a book out. Let's let let let's. Uh, the main reason that the colonel is here, and I'm glad you're here. I think the world of you, and since Thank the first you. time you were here, uh, I've considered you a friend of mine, and I'm proud to be able to use those words. And I hope yeah. you don't. I hope you would support that if anybody yes, said, absolutely. "Mo, be a friend of yours." You'd say, "Absolutely, absolutely. good yeah. American." Yeah. You know, but. Americans are cut from a certain cloth, and and to see Americans like you and 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 like uh, Senator McCain and 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 the other people, uh, uh, Mc, uh, uh, McGrath that I got the book mm-hmm. of over mm-hmm. here, Jim McGrath, Mike McGrath, Mike McGrath. I yeah. knew Jim McGrath's a cop in Atlanta, yeah. but uh, Mike McGrath and the people that were held there in those conditions for so long and came out as patriotic, if not more patriotic than they were when they went in. I I am so proud of the fact that I was born in a country that that fostered men like you guys. I just wanted to say that. Well, I would say fostered is a good word. Yeah. 
Uh, the book is called Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Lee Ellis, Colonel Lee Ellis. How do we get it? Tell me about the book. We don't have long, and I've spent more time talking about you and your history than well, <laughs> I, I, I promise you. Yeah. yeah, well, let, let, let's, uh, let, let's sell some books here. I'm going to give one away. Good. But let, and, and I'm going to have you autograph it for the, if you will, for the, sure. uh, he will, uh, but uh, for, for, for the, for the winner, uh, the book, tell me a little bit about it and how people can get it. Leading with honor by Lee Ellis. Well, it's my story that I'm telling, but it's really about some of the great leaders that we had there and the lessons from that. It's really life lessons, leadership lessons. Uh, you know, we had such great courageous leadership. I think it's about courage. It's about character. It's about competence, being good at what you do. And we had that in our leaders in spades. And I was a junior ranking guy, so I was experienced in that leadership. So you talk about my courage, but in in a way, I was riding on their coattails. And they were setting examples for me, and I was just trying to hang on and keep up. <laughs> so that's when you've got that kind of role models yes, and that sir. kind of leadership, it makes it easy to follow. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of books on leadership. I tried to tell stories because stories are emotional. You were talking about emotional uh, things before. Emotional memory is much stronger than cognitive memory. So if you can get into a story, then you can remember that lesson and you can remember that story. Then you can apply that principle in your own life. In your own life, It's second best to actually seeing it and experiencing it. But it is a powerful way to remember. So we tell the story, and then I say, here's the lesson in each chapter. Here's the lesson. And then here's how that lesson is actually being applied in today's workplace because I'm a leadership consultant for 15 years. So I take those lessons and turn them into today's situation. And the book is called Leading with Honor. How do we get it? How does the consumer Anywhere, get it? Anywhere. Uh, most bookstores have it, and it's on all Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the online stores. Uh, it's also available in ebook and all kinds of ebooks that you want to get, and then also an audio book. You're talking about the leaders that you had over there. Real quick, we got to go. I know Ron's showing me his watch here. Uh, it is a country music show, and I swear to God, program directors, we're going to get back to a little bit here on the other side of this. But uh, uh, as you remember those five years in, in mm -hmm. the Hanoi Hilton, mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember one person as being like the, the leader, or were there, there a couple? What are the names? Who was, was John McCain? Was he like the leader? Who was the leader? No, he was not the senior guy. He was a leader in courage because he had the opportunity to come home early and said, no, I'll go home and it's my turn which was a, a very courageous and honorable thing to do. Understood. But we had guys like uh, Colonel Reiser, Commander Denton, Commander Stockdale. Those were the three senior leaders that were leading us day to day overall in the camps. The military but structure that, never went away inside the walls. Right. And, but in my cell, I had a guy named Kim Fisher who was a captain. And what a tough guy. He was a state champion wrestler in New York. Mentally tough, physically tough, and morally and ethically extremely tough. And when you've got a leader like that, uh, it's easy to uh, follow in his footsteps. How many years were you there, Colonel? Five and a half years. Five years. Tell you what we'll do. We'll take caller number five at 888 moby usa Call number five. We'll get a copy of Leading with Honor, personally autographed to you from uh, Colonel Lee Ellis. Don't leave. We'll, we'll congratulate the winner in a minute, okay? Sounds good. Hey, our guest is Colonel Lee Ellis on the Moby in the Morning Show. Call number five, 888 moby usa Morning. 10 minutes after right now. We got uh, uh, Lyrical Pursuit coming up here in just a minute. I got to tell you, uh, Colonel Ellis is still here. And we've been sitting here talking. I mean, I didn't, that's the first time I've ever played Brad Paisley's Water and not listened to a word of it. Colonel, would you jump on just a second here, just for a minute? This he's, The book is Leading with Honor, uh, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Please buy a book. There, Colonel's still here. Uh, how's that? See? Good. I like I like paid for your extended, you. your extended you. stay. Uh, you're welcome. So, July 1969. The, the Apollo mission, uh, which, which, which one was it, eight that landed on the moon the first time? Whatever. Anyhow, the Apollo mission going to the moon landed on the moon. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, they're on the moon. Uh, Alan Shepard's circling, whatever. You guys in the Hanoi Hilton, you hadn't heard. We didn't know about it at all. And then in early 1970, January, February, Hanoi, Hanna, which is like Tokyo Rose sure. in Vietnam, said something about craters. If Neil Armstrong would go to the demilitarized zone, he would recognize craters there like he'd seen before. But she didn't use the word moon. But the only logical explanation was that Neil Armstrong had been to the moon. And you guys figured it out. So we figured it out. And so the next day, we got up and we went out to the wash house and we stopped in the courtyard and we could see the moon up in the sky like you can sometimes see in the daytime. Mm -hmm. We all came to attention, five of us that were in that cell, looked up at the moon and saluted because, because we knew our flag was there. Gub, is that a story or what? I love it. Man, Kurt Lewis, I love you. I mean, I think the world of you, man. You and everybody that, man, 
I just love patriotism. I love this country. And it's people like you, the only reason we still have it. Thanks, Moby. Yeah, you're God welcome. bless. God bless you. Dirk's Bentley. Yeah, baby. Four. Twitter. That is good. It is very good. What's your name? Ricky Talton. Hey, Ricky, are you as tough a man as Colonel Ellis? No. Me neither. Ricky, you got the book, Leading with Honor, Le- Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Promise me you'll read this book. I'll read it more than once. Colonel, you want to say hi to Ricky real quick? Hi, Ricky. Where are you live, Ricky? Chicago, Georgia. Well, I'm a North Georgia boy myself. Yeah. I'm up in Commerce, and Ben Purcell over in Clarksville is a great hero. I talk about Ben, and he escaped twice in this book. Wow. Ricky, thanks for listening. You stand by. Colonel, thank you. God bless you, man. And God bless America. Amen. God bless you, and God bless America.